Our Father, we thank you for the desires of our heart expressed in the song that you will take us back to the place where we received you and believed you. We pray, O oh Lord, that the revival we all desire, that we are crying and longing for, you will fulfill in every heart and life in Jesus' name. And we pray as we are desiring that you'll fill us again with your love so that we'll live the life you want us to live. Bless us as we go into your word now. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come to the session of uh, studying the selected epistle for this Congress. We've already looked at verses 1, 2, and 3 in the general epistle of Jude. And we have discovered that although there are six people referred to in the New Testament as Judas, or the shortened form abbreviated form, Jude, the one that wrote this epistle is uh, not one of the twelve original apostles, but is Jude, the brother of James, a child to Mary, the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then after the resurrection, they stopped looking at themselves as brothers to the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. They knew him as a risen Lord, a glorified Lord. And because of that, he referred to himself as the servant, the bond slave of Jesus Christ. And he says, he's writing to them that are sanctified and preserved and called. And I brought to your attention that the word called, although it's the last of those three verbs, the verbs to call, to preserve, to sanctify, although it's the last verb, yet that's where you have the emphasis. They are called. Because they responded, they were chosen. And if they are chosen and they remain faithful to the end, they will be with the Lamb of God, and forever they will reign with him. They are the called and the chosen and the faithful. These are the people that the word of God tells us about, that all things work together for good. To them that love the Lord, to them that are the called according to his purpose. And so as these are called, they are not only called, they are beloved. And they are sanctified, sanctified by God the Father, sanctified by the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, purified and purged and perfected by the blood of Christ shed without the gate. Not only that, they are preserved. Although there is cooperation between sovereignty and uh, our human voluntary will, abolition, and yet as we leave our hands in the hands of the Lord, he is able to preserve us. Remember, Jude has told us we need to stay in the arena, in the area of the love of God, so that we will be kept. But the joy of the believer is that we are called, we are sanctified, and is preserving us. And then he tells us that as we come into the kingdom, remember that we came into the kingdom on the basis of the love of God. That love will still continue. In fact, it will multiply. That the initial love is not all the love we receive. We still have multiplied love while we're now in the kingdom. By mercy, he has forgiven us. It's rich in mercy. And the initial mercy that brought us into the kingdom will now be multiplied as we are walking the way of the Lord in the kingdom. When we became born again, we are the Prince of Peace. We are the peace of God. The peace that passes understanding, flowing deep like a river, now continues as the peace is multiplied. And so Jude is writing to them that are sanctified, to them that have been preserved, and to them that are called, and he's already telling them that here is the wish of the writer, and here is the desire as well as the plan of God himself, that the mercy and the peace and the love will be multiplied. Let me remind you that Jude was very fond of triplets. I said that yesterday. In verse 1, you have the triplet, you are called, you are sanctified, 
you are preserved. In verse 2, you have the triplet, you have the mercy and the peace and the love. But then it tells us the purpose or the plan of the epistle itself. It said there was a desire within him. He had given a diligent thought to wanting to write to them and make them to understand of the common salvation. Common salvation because it is common to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Also it is common because it is the same salvation that the apostle receives that a member of the church receives. The same salvation given by the Lord and the salvation Paul received is no greater than the salvation you have received. If you are born again, it is the common salvation. Then he said, as he was uh, thinking about this, giving diligence to it, that he will write to them of the common salvation, God changed the plan. And this is inspiration. Here is God breathing out his own word, his own mind, his own will unto him. And then he said, now it was needful, it was necessary for me to write unto you. What made it necessary? Very obviously, as you look at the epistle itself, he saw that there were deceivers infiltrating the church. And from the information he had from the outside, and from the inspiration he had from the inside, the information and the inspiration combining together led him now to the epistle that we have, which is to exhort us, the believers, that we shall earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I told you yesterday that there are two words there that are very important. Number one, beloved, used more than 60 times in the New Testament. And it is showing the love in the heart of God for the people of God. And that love also in the writer for the people he was writing to. And also the saints, the holy ones. And now he tells us we are beloved. As a result of being beloved, there's something we need to do. We're exhorted that we should earnestly contain. That's what the words earnestly contain. They come from one single Greek verb. And that Greek verb is in the continual tense. It means keep on contending. That you will keep on fighting for. You'll keep on defending the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Is a once for all delivered to the saints' faith. And that we are to be earnestly fighting, earnestly contending, earnestly wrestling, defending and protecting that faith to preserve, uh, to have the purity of the faith and the preservation of the faith. And I told you that the faith here is not the faith by which we believe, but the faith that we believe. Which means the whole counsel of God, the entire gospel. The total revelation of God. Everything the Lord has given to us, he said, you must not add to it. You must not subtract from it. That is the sum total of the faith. Contend for it. Stand for it. Make sure that you preserve the purity of that faith. Now, if you look at the next verse, verse 4, it says, for, that's the linking word. To what had gone before. That word for is synonymous with the word because. It says because there are certain men. For there are certain men. It tells us now the very reason is telling us to contend earnestly for the faith. And in the things that follows, the apostle or the writer rather is going to tell us the reason that is very necessary that you will earnestly contend for the faith the necessity of defending the truth and it tells us from that verse 4 for there are certain men crept in on a ways who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our god into lasciviousness and denying the only lord god and our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, here Jude tells us uh, something about the people that he was warning the believers about. He called them certain men. And then he said they had 
been ordained. I will explain that word ordained later. And then he calls them ungodly men. In calling them ungodly men, uh, you will need to realize the word ungodly is uh, used uh, so very often in this little epistle. If you pick up that word ungodly, it's a key word in Jude. It appears, the key word ungodly, appears only four times in Romans. And Romans has 16 chapters. And in all those 16 chapters, the word appears only four times. If you look at 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, add everything together, 13 chapters, the word ungodly appears three times. And if you look at uh, 1 Peter, having uh, five uh, chapters, it appears only once. You look at 2 Peter, with its three chapters, and it appears three times. And yet, in Jude, with only one chapter, it appears six times. That makes you to understand then what a Jude was writing about. And he makes use of that word, ungodly, 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 ungodly men. But then, he didn't just say ungodly men. A Jude actually described what he said. And he used descriptive words. If you look at this little epistle, as he's talking about the ungodly men, in verse 8, he calls them filthy dreamers. That is, those who dream of pictures, images that are imaginary and unreal. But not that they are imaginary and unreal alone, they are defiling pictures. Feel the dreamers. In verse 10, he calls them brute beasts. They are ungodly. They are feel the dreamers and they are brute beasts. And then in verse 12, he really goes at it. It says they are spots. It says they are clouds without water. It says they are trees that are twice dead whose roots are plucked off. In verse 13, it says they are wandering stars. And in verse 16, it says they are murmurers and complainers. In verse 18, it says they are mockers. So then you will see that he really stretches it out and he explains it very well, the ungodly men he was writing about. These apostates, the people that are falling away from the faith, who were then turning around to bring confusion to the people that Jude wrote to, he said they were the preachers and the advocates of ungodliness. Preachers and advocates of ungodliness. We're just looking at verses 4 to 10 today. And there are four points we're going to um, speak upon. Number one, the description of apostates. Number two, the deceptiveness of apostates. Number three, the doom of apostates. Number four, disregard for authority. Let's go to number one, the description of apostates. In Jude verse four, it says, for there are certain men crept in unawares, that is, the people came in without much noise, without much publicity. It's like they crept in. They privately came in unawares, unnoticed, without anybody thinking that this could do any damage to the body of Christ. And then it says, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation? When you see that word ordained, you might say, oh, they couldn't help it. Because they were ordained and predestined to do what they did. No, that's not the implication of the uh, original language. In the Greek language, what is uh, here written in English as ordained just simply means pre-written. It's uh, like that verb in Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Where it says the thing that were written aforetime. time. So what this is saying is that these apostates, they were pre-written. It had been written about. What does that mean? Moses wrote about it. Pre-written. Not only that, the prophets like Jeremiah, like Ezekiel, like Daniel, they wrote about it. Pre-written. In fact, Jesus had spoken about it. 
that false Christs will come, false prophets will come. If it were possible, they will deceive the very elect pre-reaching. And Paul had said, after my departure, shall grievous wolves arise, entering in, and will not spare the flock. They will want to get disciples after them. Pre-reaching. And Colossians are talking about it, that will not allow anybody to deceive you with philosophy, the traditions of men. Pre-reaching. And Peter wrote before Jude. And Peter had written that as there were false teachers and prophets in the land in those days, even so, the false teachers will appear in the church, pre-reaching. So the word ordained here is not talking about uh, those who are ordained against their will. Predestinated against their will, no. It's the same word that had been translated in other parts of the New Testament as reaching before time. So then, these were before of old, already reaching about to this condemnation, ungodly men. What did these ungodly men, what did they do? They turned the grace of God into lasciviousness. Now what does that mean, they turned the grace of God to lasciviousness? That means they turned the grace of God to excess in abandoning themselves into evil. They said, see, when you sin, God has grace to wipe away the sin. And so, the more sin you commit, the more grace there is available to take away the sin. And therefore, if you don't sin as much as you can, you have not allowed God to manifest His grace. Because the more you sin, the more you do evil, the more you give a God a chance to manifest his love and to manifest his mercy and to manifest his grace. So they said, if you want God to manifest abundant grace, guess what you should do? Go ahead and commit abundant sin. That was the way they reasoned. And they turned that grace of God into an excuse for liberty license evil and do whatever you want because after all the more evil you do the more grace of god will be available for you they turn the grace of god into lasciviousness they even got to the point of even denying the only lord god our lord jesus christ and uh, here you have the description of the apostates now apostasy means falling away in your mind make a difference between falling and falling away say it this way there is an act of falling that's an action an act of falling that's backsliding there is a stage of falling away that is apostasy the difference between backsliding and apostasy is the difference between an act and a stage. It is the difference between falling and falling away. You see, when you talk about apostates, apostates are the people who had known the Lord before. But now, later, they backslid to the point of not just an act of sin, but then they now sinned habitually. They went beyond sinning habitually to defending sin. They went beyond habitual sinning, defending sinning, to actively promoting and preaching sin. They went beyond the backsliding, the sinning habitually, the defending of sin, the promotion and the preaching of sin, and they went to denying Christ. And they went beyond denying Christ to trampling under their feet. The atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and counting the blood of Jesus Christ unnecessary for salvation. It's a whole stretch, a continuum. That is start from the act, they repeat it, it becomes habitual. Now they begin to defend sin and now they go all the way to pushing up Christ trampling upon him and eventually they even say the blood is of no value at all from that you understand 
that apostates do not take a single leap into apostasy, but they take many steps which eventually lead them from an arch to an habit to a stage. Here we notice the steps, and I need to carefully give this to you. I'm praying that none of you will become apostate in Jesus' name. But let's say we have to study scripture because the Lord has given us the whole scripture to study. And since it's been given unto us the gift of God, the word of God, we need to study it. I'm going to show you six steps in the stretch, in the line, in the continuum of apostasy. Starting from the arch of sinning to the final stage of apostasy and falling away. The first step is backsliding and then repeated backsliding. There is an arch of backsliding and a fellow may cry a little and a fellow may have remorse and a fellow may regret what he has done and he says I've repented, he comes back, he backslides again. And then he comes back, he backslides again. And then he comes back, he backslides again. And he has repeated, incessant, perpetual backsliding. Watch it. That's on the road to apostasy. In Jeremiah chapter 5. The last two lines in your Bible of verse 6. Verse 6, last two lines. Because their transgressions are many. Their backslidings are increased. That's where apostasy starts with backslidings increasing. Chapter 8 of Jeremiah, verse 4. Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus says the Lord, Shall they fall and not rise? Shall he turn away and not return? Why then is this people of Jerusalem sliding back by a perpetual backsliding? They hold fast deceit. They refuse to return. That's the very first step. If somebody is going in the downward trend of apostasy, he holds fast to deceit. He refuses to return and he multiplies backsliding Hosea chapter 11 Hosea chapter 11 in verse 7 my people are bent on they are bent to backsliding from me they are determined they're going to remain in their state of backsliding that's the very first step that eventually may lead to apostasy number two deliberate rejection of God's word and mercy after somebody has fallen into sin the lord is still saying why will you die i want you to come back i love you with everlasting love call upon me and i will answer you let the wicked forsake his way but the one that has stepped on the road to apostasy apart from perpetual backsliding apart from repeated backslidings he rejects deliberately the word of God and rejects the mercy of God. Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. The first part of verse 17, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. That's the next step after the backsliding. The fellow is hearing the word of God and he says, I know that's coming from the Lord. As for the word you are spoken to us in the name of the Lord, why are you wasting your time? Why don't you go and preach to other people? We will not hearken unto thee. And here is our decided position. We will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. Therefore, you might continue to preach if you want to be wasting your time. We have decided we are going to deliberately reject the word of God. That's a stage that is worse than ordinary backsliding. Now, the third point, number three, is the love for deceit. And for false doctrine, it is not only that this fellow now is backsliding, 
it is not that he's just neutral to sound doctrine. It is not that he's neutral to the word coming from the Lord. He is not having love for deceit. Love for deceit. That goes a little bit beyond ordinary backsliding. There are people that backslide and they are very sorrowful. And they are writing prayer requests. I don't like the state in which I am. Oh Lord, take me back. Oh Lord, won't you take me back? There is hope for such backsliders. But you see, there are some other kinds of backsliders. They get to the point, they love deceit. Jeremiah again, chapter 5. And in verse 31, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. They know it is deceit. They just enjoy it. They love the lies and the deceit and the false doctrine. They just embrace it and they say, Yes, we've been long enough with all that holiness stuff. They call it stuff now. We've been long enough with that kind of righteousness, do's and don'ts, rules, regulations, stuff. But now we want to get on something that will minister to our self-esteem and that will minister to our flesh. We want to enjoy all that kind of bondage, don't do this, don't do that. And uh, liberty. We now want liberty. No more holiness, do whatever you want. And although they know that there is deceit in this new system, they love to have it so. That's on the way down in the way of apostasy. Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, verses 9 and 10. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not. And to the prophets, Prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things and prophesy deceit. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. And they are still religious. They still want prophecy. They still want a preacher. They still want somebody to be telling them something, but they say, make it smooth, make it nice, make it interesting. Don't tell us things that are strict. Don't tell us things that will crucify the flesh. Don't tell us things that will require self-denial. Don't tell us things that will not be easy. We want everybody to come in, prophesy deceit unto us. They come to the point, they love deceit, they love false doctrine. And that's not the end of the road. Even at that point, they can still be redeemed. They can still come back. And they can still turn around and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been rejoicing in evil. But now, they take the next step, which is almost getting to the end of the line. Number four, denial of his Christ and his atonement. Denial of Christ and his atonement in Second Peter, Second Peter, chapter two, and in verse one. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately privilege shall bring in damnable heresies, not innocent, trivial, neutral. Heresies that do not matter, that won't hurt anybody. That if you still believe the Bible, even though they are saying some things that are wrong, it still doesn't affect your faith. No, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. They were saved before, they knew the Lord before, they were redeemed before. They now deny that same Lord that bought them and they bring upon themselves sweet destruction in Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrews chapter 10 verse 29 of how much sorrow punishment suppose ye shall ye be thought worthy 
who has trodden underfoot the Son of God. How can you tread the Son of God underfoot? Can I just uh, illustrate, explain for you to understand? Here is, make a picture in your mind, a backslider. And the Lord is standing before him and saying, Won't you come back home? What have I done that you have forsaken me? I died for you on the cross of Calvary. See the blood I shed for you. And while the Lord is standing before him uh, to restrain him from going further in sin and in backsliding, and he was bent to backslide, bent to go on, he pushed Jesus down. It's blasphemous. That's what happens. And then, instead of going around, despising the Lord, he walked over him and went his way. That's treading on the Son of God, treading underfoot the Son of God, and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. We're not talking about people that never knew the Lord. We're talking about people that were bought and purchased and redeemed. And the people that were not only saved but sanctified. It says he was sanctified. But now he counts that blood an unholy thing. And he has done despite to the spirit of grace. He has told the spirit of grace, the spirit of God, leave me alone. Let me live my life. Damn the consequence. That's apostasy. That's going too far. But that's not even the end. He has now denied the Lord. The Lord that bought him. Then you will think that man will not be religious anymore. Well, the Bible says point number five. is not preaching error. And doctrines of demons. He now, he doesn't stop preaching. He now preaches error. And doctrines of demons. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, chapter, 1 Timothy chapter 4, rather, from verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. They were in the faith before. We're talking about apostates. We're talking about those who have not only stopped our backsliding, they've gone beyond that. They will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. And doctrines of devils. And now in verse 2, preaching, teaching, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What does that mean? Sometimes you see when uh, a hot iron has been used to brand an animal, that place where the hot iron had been used to brand that animal, to make a mark on the animal, it doesn't have any feeling in that place. And uh, if you make a mistake, for example, and you have hot iron, and it brands or makes a mark on your hand, the, that place will look dead. There will be no feeling there. Like all other parts of the body may have feeling. It says their conscience have been bra branded like that with a hot iron, and the conscience has not feeling anymore. You that still have conscience, you'll say, but my friend, this is hypocrisy. Well, you may feel it, I don't feel it. you say, but this is deception. See what you are saying. See what you are preaching. And you were saved before, you were sanctified before. See what you are telling people now. He doesn't feel anything like you are feeling because the conscience is seared with a hot iron. In fact, he tells us now that holiness is bad, bad bondage. And it tells us that living in liberty and let go. Let go every restraint. Go anywhere you want. Drink anything you want. Smoke anything you want. And practice anything you want. It says that is the good thing. You need a release. You need liberty. You need you to get out of that prison of holiness. Out of that prison and bondage of righteousness. Let go and be free. He calls good evil, and he calls evil good. That's apostasy. Don't you see Isaiah? Isaiah chapter 5, and in verse 20. Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe to them that call evil good, and they call good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter 
and they don't stop there in verse 21. One to them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. The last bit on the road in apostasy is number six, corrupting God's people and causing them now to backslide. That means that the apostates decide, I will not perish alone. If I'm going to die, if I'm going to perish, multitudes must perish with me. That's the final step. That he knows that he has gone astray. He knows that his conscience is seared with a hot iron, and then he teaches other people, influences other people to do as he has done, go against the word of the Lord, tell lies and deceive, and go in the way of backsliding and apostasy, saying, I will not backslide alone, come along with me. That is a serious matter. Because he that shall make one of these little ones that believe in me to offend and to go astray, it were better he were not born. Malachi chapter 2. In Malachi chapter 2, we're reading from verse 6. Malachi 2, verse 6 to verse 8. The law of truth was in his mouth. That's past tense. No more in his mouth. Was in his mouth. Iniquity was not found in his leaves. He walked, past tense, with me in peace and equity. He did turn many away from iniquity. He was an effective soul winner and preacher, past tense. For the priest's leaves should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But, verse 8, he had departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law. Ye have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so you see the last bit of that is causing many other people to backslide. Causing many other people to go away from the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 44. Ezekiel chapter 44. Verse 12. Because they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore have I lifted up mine hand against them, says the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. This is what Jude is writing about. He's writing about apostates. He's writing about the people that knew the Lord before, but then they took a step in the wrong direction and they backslid. And now not only that they backslid, they are turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and they are encouraging excess in evil, abandoning themselves into sin and iniquity. And they are saying, let go, enjoy whatever you want to enjoy in the world. There is no judgment anywhere. Go ahead and let yourself lose. And he turned that grace of God into lasciviousness. You see, that is apostasy. And so we have had the description of apostates. Let us now go to point number two. This is deceptiveness of apostates. The apostates, they deceive. We go back to Jude again and in verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Innocent that's how they appear. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. And it appears, can this one do any evil? Can this one ever hurt anybody? He has just such a nice, wonderful posture and gesture that he could not even dream or think or imagine of harming, of a harming anyone. But it says, they crept in unawares. That is, the ministers, the leaders in the church will not even take note of them because they crept in, they moved in, they came in, they mixed with the people of God unaware, so notice, who were before of old pre-written to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God, our God, into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Apostates do not merely stop at backsliding. They are bent on getting others confused 
and they are bent on making as many as possible turn away from the Lord. They deceive the simple-hearted people by distorting the truth of the word of God, by denying the great doctrines of full salvation in Christ, like antinomians. Antinomians uh, is a combination of two words, anti, that means against, norm. That's when you say something is a norm, that's the law. Antinomian then means against the law. Those who tell people that they should live anyhow, any way they want to live. Those are antinomians, that it doesn't really matter. There's no holiness anywhere. Nobody can be holy and uh, therefore don't even try. They turn the grace of God into a cover for continued sinning. And uh, they turn the grace of God into indecency, lack of restraint and excess. They release themselves to say and do all kinds of evil without restraint, check, or control. And they eventually reject even the absolute lordship and atoning merits of the Lord Jesus Christ. In um, Second Peter chapter 2 again. Second Peter chapter 2 and from verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Here Peter is uh, telling us something that we need to take note of. He looks at the past and immediately looks at the future. He said there were in the past. And then he tells us there shall be in the future. He's telling us something. He said look at every generation of believers and you will see there were. And therefore, you will understand, there will be. If you look at the congregation in the wilderness, uh, you had Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. There were. And therefore, there will be. If you look at the time of Samuel, there was a Saul. There were. And therefore, there will be. If you look at the time of the prophets, there was a Jeremiah. There was the other one that said uh, that prophecy that Jeremiah has given that Israel will go 70 years into captivity. It's not so. Only two years they will come back. And God said, Jeremiah, you tell him, you are taking the yoke of wood away from them. You are fashioned for them a yoke of iron. There were in the past. He said, don't you even remember, don't you remember even the congregation of Jesus Christ? Don't you know that among the few favored disciples of Jesus, only 12, there was a Judas Iscariot. There were and there will be. Don't you remember the revival in Samaria? There was a Simon there that said, give me money. I said, I give you this money so that you can give me the Holy Ghost. Or whosoever I lay my hand, they will receive the Holy Ghost. There were, even then there will be an Ananas and Sapphira in the Jerusalem church, headquarters church. There were and there will be Paul the apostle, the greatest of all those apostles and teachers. There was the demons that was with him before, no more with him now. There were, therefore there will be. Now, here Peter is looking back and he's telling us that as we look at all the generations of believers, there were false prophets among the people in the past. And that is an indication that even as there shall be false teachers among you, it's telling us then that it has not stopped in the past alone. In the future, it is still going to continue. Then he said they will privately bring in damnable heresies, even denying the law that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction in verse 2 and many shall follow their pernicious ways oh you see if somebody really is preaching lie nobody will believe him if somebody goes out and he will not preach the whole bible nobody will follow him ah why are you saying that you are talking like this have you forgotten that jehovah's witnesses are more than deeper life why are you talking like that? Have you forgotten that Seventh-day Adventists, they run into their millions more than deeper life? Why are you talking like that? Have you forgotten that the Mormons are more in number than the Pentecostal people? Why are you talking like that? Have you forgotten that the people that are preaching error, the people that have the inspiration, illumination, impartation of the devil behind them and within them, that they are very, very aggressive people? You talk about strategy. Jehovah's Witnesses have strategy, only there is no salvation. 
and you talk about seven day adventures the seven day adventures people their sabbaths and all the ceremonial laws and the bondage of judaism they have strategies and they are in, in many countries of the world and you talk about the mormons uh, they have strategies too you talk about printing you talk about finance you talk about management you talk about a lot of things all these false systems they have the management the administration the communication the radio ministry the literature ministry and everything don't think that false prophets will never have followers. They will have followers. Don't think that backsliders and the apostates will not have followers. They will have followers. They'll have followers among the people that have been complaining that, uh -uh, is this the way we're going to spend the rest of our lives? No smoking, no jewelry, and all those interesting pictures on the televisions that a person will be there like this, he will not feel like sleeping. Do you mean that for the rest of my life I will miss all those pornographic, pornographic things? You mean that one cannot even gamble and play lottery to get money? You mean that one will just be walking only the straight and narrow way and lose all his friends? You mean that the fellow will not even worship idols at all? Well, when they see an alternative, that there's another place over there that now says, come, everyone that comes here now, there is liberty. Everything you are afraid of doing before, go ahead and do it now. Nobody is going to discipline you. Ah, they said, my kind of church has arrived. Now I am going where I really have been dreaming I will get all these years. That's how they will have the converse. In verse 2 it says, Many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And you find that those people that have gone into the way of liberty, into the way of unrestrained sinning, into the way of no control, no check, no discipline, they begin to speak evil of all the good, good things that the Bible is teaching us about. And in verse 3, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. The point is this. Those apostates, the majority of them, are clever, sweet mouthed, sugar coated uh, communicators who have the ability to deceive the people. In fact, Jesus said, False Christ and false prophets will arise. If it were possible, they will deceive the very elect. We are praying for you that you will not be deceived. Because you know, who is behind all this deception? It's the devil. And if you don't understand, the devil knows how beautiful heaven is. He had been there before. But he knows that he has been cast out and he will never get there again. And therefore he's thinking, how many people can I take with me? Do you realize that hell was not made for any man? But those on the left hand side will be told, depart into hell fire, made for Satan and who? and his angels and the, the devil is saying so jesus will take all the people to heaven and i will not have anybody in hell not like that and therefore he's gone out now all over the world and uh, think about where the devil is doing his greatest evangelism among holiness people among the people that are going to heaven uh, you know, that's our experience in Lagos here. There are some mushroom things, uh, you know, that are, you know, getting started in Lagos here. This one is doing that. This one is doing that. And some of the conditions they give them, you'll be surprised. Very terrible things they say there. But you know where they concentrate their evangelism? They concentrate their evangelism on deeper life. If, uh, you know, somebody committed adultery in our church in deeper life and we discipline him, quickly they go to that person. They say, ah, what are you doing there? We love you. Who doesn't uh, have a problem? Come, forget about the adultery. And then they make him something. Then they ask him, are there anybody that are disciplined like you over there in deeper life? And he gives them the list of names and their houses and they'll be going to the houses of those who are under discipline. You know, think about that. The people that the Lord is chastising them, disciplining them, so that they will be partakers of his holiness. These uh, messengers of, uh, the, of the strange religion, they will be coming to those people. They will not allow them to pray and make right their ways. And then they, they are going to the other side. But you will not be deceived. 
all the prayers you are praying and saying, oh God, take me there, take me back. It will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Don't be afraid. Jesus is praying for you. And this church is praying for you. And even if you are weak and you are saying, oh Lord, I know I'm not stronger than any of those other people that have been deceived, but I want to stay with the Lord. The Lord will keep you to the end. In Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. When we are talking of apostates, you may be thinking they are only men. No, there are women. It says this one, a woman, she called herself a prophetess. I don't know, there may be some who say they are prophetesses in deeper life. They call themselves that, we don't call them that. There may be a woman in deeper life that say, I'm praying, I'm praying. And will then, while praying, will find an interesting verse of scripture. He will take that, she will take that verse of scripture as prophecy. And she'll be looking for you and say, uh, brother, uh, I was praying. And God gave me a word from heaven. And then will give it to you. And it may be a good word, it may be a verse of the Bible or whatever. And you, he says, that's for you, that's for you. The Lord gave it to me for you. Well, it's paving the way to come back and give you another word. Paving the way to come back and give you another word. If you don't take care, in a few weeks, that woman will be controlling your life. Any step you want to take, she has a word. She has an instruction. She has an inspiration. She has something she wants to tell you. And she calls herself a prophetess. That's going the way of backsliding and apostasy. In any church in deeper life, we don't allow any man, any woman to rule the lives of the pastors and to rule the lives of our overseers. Leave the overseers alone. Let them take their decisions as they are, they are led by the Spirit of God rather than one woman somewhere, one man somewhere going to those leaders. I have a word for you. I have an instruction for you. I have revelation for you. I have a prophecy for you. We don't want the apostates and the backsliders to be taking some verses out of the Bible and confusing men in this church. Let the men rule and let them organize. Let them lead the church the way they ought to. Now you know that uh, if you look at the Bible very well you will find except when in the Bible that the uh, commonwealth of Israel they had backsliding to the point there was no man in Israel like at the time of Deborah and uh, you find a few times like that when you find that a woman ruled and was the judge over the people of God but as you look at the whole Bible you will understand that God has always selected men. In the case of Moses, that's a man. In the case of Aaron, the high priest, that was a man. In the case of Samuel, that was a man. In the case of Saul, that was a man. In the case of David, that was a man. Look at all the uh, prophets. In the case of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, those who are men. Come to the New Testament. Jesus Christ is a man. All his 12 disciples, do you find one woman among those apostles? All men. Look at uh, the Jerusalem church. And when they said, we're going to choose and appoint people that will be taking care of the distribution of the food, look ye among you seven men of honest report. They were men. Look at the deacons. They said the deacons should be this, this. And the wives should be like this. Which means they should be men. And when you look at the real people that are actually leading the church, you'll find they were men. And so we don't uh, want anything to change that and say what a man can do, a woman can do, not in leadership, in the church. And therefore you find this woman here that called herself. The church didn't call her that. And the people of God didn't call her that. She called herself a prophetess. And what was she doing? She was seducing, deceiving my servants to commit fornication. You know, they are very clever. Whether they are men or they are women, they are very clever, seducing them to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I pray that God will um, deliver us from the deception in Jesus' name. In uh, number three now, doom 
of the apostates, the doom of the apostates. We're now back in uh, Jude verses 5, 6, and 7. Jude verses 5, 6, and 7. We're looking at the doom of the apostates. I will therefore put you in remembrance. The first thing you want to know here is that Jude was writing to the people that understood the Old Testament. The very fact that you have understood something doesn't mean that we sh there should not be a reconsideration. I'm preaching it again. You see, sometimes when you see the program and you see that what we're dealing with is what you knew already. Then you will say, well, I know that already. Yes, but we must put you in remembrance. Look at verse 17. But beloved, remember, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so even though we have known those things before, we need to be reminded of them. Back into verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of that great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, set as set for an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Here we have the doom. And as Sir Jude is talking about the doom here, can you see the various people he mentioned? Number one, he mentioned the judgment of God against unbelieving Israelites. Number two, he mentioned the judgment of God against unfaithful angels. Number three, he mentioned the judgment of God against unclean, immoral Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, it's uh, looking into, the, into three sections. One, in heaven. Two, on earth. He looks into the realm of the angels that were created holy. And then he looks into the realm of men. He talks of total unbelievers who never knew the Lord. And he talked of Israel that were redeemed and saved and delivered out of Egypt. And he said, in every case, among the holy angels, among the redeemed men in Israel, among the natural men in Sodom and Gomorrah, when they fell back into evil so much that the Lord could not contain again, he judged them. And then he uses this to sound warning concerning the backsliders and the apostates today. That if they persist in backsliding, if they get to apostasy, that judgment will come against them. Once again, he tells us about holy, supernatural angels who fell. They were judged. He talks about redeemed, delivered Israel who backslid. They were judged. He talked about unconverted, hardened sinners in Sodom and Gomorrah, persisted in sin. They were judged. The warning then is this. It's very clear. Backsliders, hardened sinners, and apostates will suffer the wrath of eternal fire. And uh, that's the reason we ought to take care so that the judgment of God will not come upon us. Now, referring to the history of the children of Israel that he made allusion to, let's see in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. No doubt they were saved. No doubt they were redeemed. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No doubt the grace of God was upon them. But backsliding came. That knocks eternal security at the root, at the head, at the storm, in the branches, in the reasoning, in the consequences, everywhere, everywhere, it knocks eternal security. There are people that tell us that once you are saved, you are forever saved. 
And no matter what you do after that, the Lord cannot but think of you as somebody that is still saved. The testimony of the whole scripture is against that. There is a promise of God is able to keep you, but then if you stray away, there is judgment for backsliders and apostates. Now in verse 5, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent, we shall not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So it is a warning unto us that the things that happen to them well, will not allow the things to happen to us. In Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. Reading from verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, and condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. You see all these references we're reading? It tells you God's action in the past is an indication of his action in the future. He judged the angels that fell. He will judge men that fall. He judged the people of the old covenant that turned back into sin. He will judge the people in the new covenant that turned back into sin. And this is what we are being told here in that verse 6, making them an example unto those that after in the future should live ungodly. So then you see there is the doom of uh, eternal judgment, the doom for the apostates. In Jude, again, Jude, the latter part of verse uh, 7, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now you will see that uh, this judgment uh, of eternal fire is uh, for the devil, for his angels, and for the backsliding people that refuse to return, and for the apostates as well. In Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, here are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In verse uh, 41, Then shall he say unto them, also on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Those things were prepared for the devil and his angels. But the men, the women that live in sin and remain in sin, they also eventually will go there. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 from verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and he shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity. There are two categories of people that will go to hell. Number one, the people that offend. What does that mean? It means the people that make others to backslide. Those who offend, one of these little ones that believe in me, they cause the believers to go astray. You see, there are some people, maybe you are clever as a sinner, backslider. Although you might still be there, and the people don't know that you are a backslider, but you have something against your overseer in the, in the region, and you are saying, I will not allow them to trace this kind of uh, conspiracy to me. Therefore, I will not directly do anything or say anything. And then you call somebody. You say, please, don't mention me. We need to plan this conspiracy against this uh, region of us here because we need to get him removed. And uh, we must do it by all means. We, if we cause confusion, if we cause some people to backslide, if we, we just do anything and everything, in fact, whatever it takes, we might even get a girl and make this girl go to that overseer and do everything possible and make that overseer to fall. We want him to be changed. But I will never come out as if I'm part of that conspiracy. So, uh, this man is very bad, he's still treating us. He's, in fact, he's not even from our tribe. 
uh, to think about you may put him here we must get rid of him yeah for what we're going to do don't link me up because i'm a coordinator i'm you know very close uh, to the top in the ministry i don't want my name to be there but if you go back and you talk to that one talk to that one and talk, even if you can get a girl that will be so loose and get near him will be watching all the things that are going on and eventually when that girl gets into sin with him then we'll raise up an alarm but don't let them know that you know i'm involved and therefore he's still teaching sir, the scripture he's still doing everything and he's saying yes sir, yes sir, to the region overseer and this conspiracy is very strong and the region overseer is just you know having a nice time preaching the word of god and his uh, coordinators are trusted people wonderful people he trusts them that nobody will do anything and we're all planning for growth and planning for evangelism and this head of the conspiracy is planning with them but he's monitoring the things he says should be happening and eventually they get a girl you can get jezebel in any town you can get anybody anywhere that will go to that uh, overseer and without that overseer knowing that this one is a plot this one that they have really finalized everything and that one is still counseling counseling and the lady is you know they have thought how to do it and eventually makes the fellow to fall and goes back to report to them we have done it eh? you are sure you've done it okay then they write a petition to state overseer and they say that our overseer has fallen he has committed sin he must be disciplined if he doesn't get the discipline the people will not know that we're supporting righteousness state overseer will come and investigate and say region overseer what have you done i said it's the devil well is the devil in company of that coordinator although that coordinator will not be disciplined because they don't even know that is part of the plot it is the other fellow that actually did the thing he might go scot free but he will not get to heaven he didn't tell the lie directly himself he didn't uh, get to doing the adultery himself but he made a jezebel a woman in that place to commit sin you are one of the people that offend that's how they do the politics in the world that the people that are really causing the trouble you wouldn't know they are troublemakers at all you will not catch any word from them that they said that was wrong it is the other people they have trained the people they have uh, pumped everything into that will be telling the lies making the deception and if you uh, confront them and say see what uh, i had that uh, your people said my people who said that i told him to say that i'm a child of god i'm not against anybody i'm just preaching the bible did they say that i said that such and such thing happened and you will never hear that he was the one that said it but he was the one that taught them and planned everything that the people who are willing to sin they went to commit the sin but he was the one that made them to do the sinning all those people are going to hell because they are the people that make other people to do wrong the people that offend and them that now do iniquity on their own may god deliver us in jesus name and so we have in that passage i've read to you the doom of the apostates now the apostates as we round up now in point number four they disregard authority that's point number four disregard for authority in a jude reading now from verse 8 likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh they despise dominion and speak evil of dignities for them they don't want to recognize any leadership in the church for them they don't want to know that anybody can speak with authority unto them for them they do not know that anybody can teach them anything they feel that they are sufficient by themselves without a teacher without a pastor without a leader without a guide without a counselor and so it says these people the marks of apostasy and the marks of backsliding they are the people that defile the flesh they despise dominion and they speak evil of dignities now here Jude is going to tell us something and uh, here you need to pay attention because you don't find what Jude is saying here in the Old Testament and yet he's using Old Testament 
uh, data, Old Testament story. And yet he's bringing in a new information that he got from the Lord and it concerns the body of Moses. Before I get into those verses 9 and 10, this will not be the first time when you find this in the New Testament. There are some things in the New Testament that we now have added information about. Peter was writing in 2 Peter chapter 2 and was writing about Noah and was writing about the time of the flood. If you check up the story in Genesis, you will not find once in the Genesis account that Noah was a preacher. Where do you find that? You find that in 2 Peter. And it's 2 Peter that tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. How did he know that since it was not in the Old Testament? That's by inspiration. You find another time Paul was writing. And Paul was writing about the people that confronted Moses. That is the magicians that confronted Moses. In the Old Testament, all that you see in the Old Testament is that when, they, when Aaron and Moses, when they had performed the miracle, they threw the rod down, it became serpent. Then we are told, Pharaoh called the magicians. And when he called the magicians, he said, do the same thing. And they did the same thing. The heart of Pharaoh was hardened. But you will not find the names of those magicians in the Old Testament. Where do you find the names of those magicians? You'll find it in the New Testament. When Paul the Apostle was writing and he said, those people that are opposing the truth, they will be like the people that opposed Moses and they will not go any further. And now he mentions their name. How did he get their names when we are not even given their names in the Exodus account? That's by inspiration. Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 3. Verse 8, now as Jans and Jambres withstood Moses, so these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the truth. Uh, Paul gives us their names by inspiration. Well, with that understanding, it happened to Peter, telling us Noah, a preacher of righteousness, information that you don't have in the Old Testament account, and the Moses giving us the names of those who withstood Moses, the names you don't find in the Old Testament, now we come to Jude. And in Jude verse 9, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses and does not bring against him a railing accusation but said, the Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Now here Jude was showing how unreasonable, how unrighteous, how unreasonable it is for these people to go against the authority of the apostles and the authority of the ministers of God, that is, the backsliders and the apostates. He now brings this illustration. He said, don't these people think, don't they remember that Michael the archangel, you know, when Moses died, God did not allow the children of Israel to touch the body of Moses. Because he knew the children of Israel, they might begin to worship the dead body. And they might keep the body somewhere. Understand, the children of Israel have been hundreds of years in Egypt. And normally, anybody that studies ancient history, even till now, you will know. The Egyptians, they had the method of preserving a dead pharaoh for hundreds of years and the body will not go rotting. They had studied their science up to that point in treating the body of the dead. That that dead person can be there for hundreds of years. And these were slaves in Egypt. And they were the people that were helping all the Egyptians to do all those things, the embalming and everything. And he knew that since they knew the method of doing it, if he allowed them and gave them the body of Moses, they will preserve the body of Moses and carry it to the land of Canaan. They will build a shrine for it. Anybody that needs water again out of the rock, anybody that needs manna to eat again, anybody that needs a healing virtue, anybody that needs anything, they'll just be saying, go and touch the body of Moses. It will become idol worship. 
Therefore, the Lord did not allow them to deal or to touch the body of Moses. Now, from this account, God sent the angel Michael and said, go and take care of the body. Before Michael got there, Satan was there already. And Michael wanted to do what the Lord told him to do and bury that body. And the devil said, you are not going to do that. I have authority over this one. And if you are there, I know you are not there, I wasn't there too. What will the devil have been saying? Ah, uh ah, -uh, this one is a murderer. He killed the Egyptian. I, Satan, am the chief murderer from the beginning. He is my follower. I will take his body. What, do you, what are you, don't you know that he struck the rock two times? And he was unfaithful to God? Why are you coming as Angel Michael and you are coming into my arena wanting to take his body away from me? I have the ownership and authority on the body of Moses. That problem was on. The children of Israel did not know that any problem was on. There are things that happen in the invisible that only by inspiration you will be able to get them. But eventually, Michael, the greatest of the holy angels, fighting, battling with Satan, the most terrible of the evil angels. The point is this, he did not directly insult him. He did not directly abuse him. He said, the Lord, not me. When you are in the kingdom, you are Lucifer, the morning star. You are higher than me. Although you are falling now, I still respect authority. And even though you are no more in the kingdom now, but when you are there, you are higher, you are greater than myself. Therefore now, although you are not in the kingdom again, although you are not the Lucifer, the morning star, the greatest of the angels again, the covering cherub again, still I cannot insult you. But the Lord sent me. The Lord will deal with you himself. And when he said that, Satan had to give way because he transferred the problem to the hands of the Lord. You know what Jude is telling us? Jude is telling us that if the greatest of the holy angels will not abuse, will not insult the most terrible of the evil angels, how is it that you don't recognize dominion, dignitary, authority in the church? How is it you don't know those who are higher than you spiritually? How is it you don't know when an overseer comes here and he presents the word of God that is higher than you by calling, by ministry? When somebody higher than you has already laid down the principle in the back, you don't even have the courtesy of Michael to say an authority has spoken. An authority that had fallen, had spoken. He knew that what he spoke was wrong, but he said, I will not abuse you. I will not talk against you. The Lord will deal with you himself. Why then don't you, if you are not a backslider, if you are not an apostate, why don't you commit everything to the hands of the Lord and say, I will not touch the anointed of the Lord. Those of us who are still standing by the grace of God, our overseers are here in this conference, they are still standing by the grace of God. Region overseers who are here, who are still standing by the grace of God. District pastors who are here, who are still standing. National overseers, missionaries who are still standing by the grace of God. God put them there. And why? If Michael will not go against the one that had fallen, how is it you are talking against those who are still standing? And you will not respect authority. And you will say, let them say their own. Even angel Michael will not do that. Take, learn your lesson. But as I round up, think about this. Moses, the greatest of all ministers. His name appears right from Exodus. Go through the Bible, open the Psalms, open in the prophets, open in the period of the judges, open in the period, open Joshua, open the period of the prophets, open the New Testament, look at the Acts of the Apostles, and look at the epistles, and go into Revelation, you have his name coming up and down. His name is everywhere. And yet, when he died, Satan came and said, I'll take care of his body. It belongs to me. Because he struck that rock two times. I inspired him to do it. And he obeyed me. He's my servant. 
And Michael said, he's a servant of He said, shut up. I know more than you know. He's my servant. And they had to be dragging his body. When you die, what will happen in the invisible realm? When you leave this area, what will happen in the invisible realm? If you get involved now in occultism, in idol worship, in secret sin, we may not know, eventually, before, if the rapture doesn't take place immediately, then you die. And then in the invisible realm, Satan comes and says, I want to come and claim my property. We will not be there then. For Moses, God sent Michael, the greatest in Israel. He sent the greatest in heaven to take care of him. What will happen when it comes to your turn? Rise up and let us pray. The Lord can wash us whiter than snow today. Grace is still available. The mercy of God is still available. Touch not the anointed of the Lord. Don't speak evil against any of the anointed of the Lord. Recognize dominion, authority, and dignities. Recognize the Lordship of Christ, the sovereignty of God, and recognize the authority of Christian leaders too. Put yourself in the hands of the Lord. Don't let the devil have any claim upon your life. See all these things that we have learned. And see all the steps from the act of, of backsliding to the state of apostasy. Pray that the Lord will help you. You will not even start on that road of apostasy at all, at all. 